Without any further ado, I'm going to call on Jacob Prash. And by the way, you're going to have to keep up with him because he likes to wander from that end of the stage to this end of the stage. And uh, he drives Seth crazy up there with the, the little video camera. But we're going to call on Jacob now. The actual truth is it's more difficult to hit a moving target. That's why I walk around. Are we amplified? Seth, are we amplified now? No. No signal. I got a green light. You have it now? The reason I move around, it's more difficult to hit a moving target. My name is indeed Jacob, and it's wonderful to be with you. I was born in New York, as you can tell from my Robert De Niro, Bugs Bunny, Barbara Streisand accent. My family are Israeli, but I live in England, right? I'm international because, uh, again, being wanted in 36 states plus the District of Columbia, it helps to be mobile. Uh, somebody already asked me, and if I don't do it, they're going to be very angry, so I'm expected to pray in Hebrew. Therefore, it was good enough for King David, it's good enough for us. Avinu Markeno, anakta madim laha bishvukola brahotra, anakta kobana memha. Ana Adonai tishpokhu rachecha aleinu, betiftak et enayim shalano at the of the recha. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your goodness and blessings. We ask you to pour your spirit upon us, opening our eyes to your word, its glory and its meaning. More than this, Father, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. One of the things our ministry does is we try to expound the Word of God, not from a purely Gentile Christian perspective, but from a Judeo-Christian perspective. We try to go back and understand the Scriptures the way the first century church would have, New Testament having been written, of course, by Jews. If you'd like to join us, our next Bible study tour of Israel is in September, and you can get a brochure out at our table. We go there and we don't go on a vacation or a pilgrimage or anything like that. We study the Word of God on archaeological locations. Our tour guides are all Israeli Jewish believers and we go strictly for Bible study. We meet together with Israeli believers and Israeli pastors. Our next Bible study tour is in September uh, this year, uh, September 8th. If you can't come, my latest book is Israel, the Church, and the Jews. Uh, <clears throat> compendium of subjects dealing with Israel, the church, and the Jews, including prophecy. And as we speak, my son Eli, who was born in Galilee, my children are both born in Galilee, my son Eli, after three years of law school, is on a tank in the Golan Heights. He's in the Israeli army. Three years of law school to ride on a tank. I thought Jews are supposed to be smart people. I was always afraid of having a son for fear of God. He turned out to be like me. In any event, <clears throat> we've been hearing a lot of things today from Roger, from Gary, from Dave Hawking, from Dave Hunt, about the state of things in the church and the way things are going. The Bible indeed speaks of apostasy in the last days. It speaks of these things going to happen. But what has shocked most people who are astute is the speed at which it has happened. The pace at which, at one time, evangelical churches and denominations major so-called evangelical leaders who you thought were biblically solid have at best compromised and too frequently have gone into these things and are subscribing to it. Of course it's the money preachers, of course it's dominion theology, it's the invasion of new age into the church. And if you really look at the purpose-driven agenda, that's essentially what it is. It is a combination of marketing psychology and new age infiltrating the church it is the doorway into something called the emergent church. Roger pointed out the statements made by Rick Warren in Davos, Switzerland at, an, at a globalist conference. The future is religious pluralism. What happened to I am the way, the truth, and the life? Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Now it's religious pluralism. First it began with the ecumenical movement. You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. Where does it stop? But what is troubling is how many born-again Christians are subscribing to this kind of agenda? Why is this happening? Then we go to the emergent church. Dan Kimball, 
his book forwarded by Brian McLaren and by Rick Warren. Brian McLaren said the church, the church should declare a five-year moratorium on homosexual ordination and same-sex marriage. The church should declare a moratorium for five years. And if we don't have a solution in five years, we should declare another five years. Then the church should decide. By what authority can the church decide something God has already decided? God already decided it was Adam and Eve. How can the church decide it's going to be Adam and Steve? But you understand what's happening? These are people who say they are born again who are doing this. These are people who say they're saved. These are people who claim to believe the word of God, who are subscribing to this agenda. How does this happen? This moral landslide, this apostasy from fundamental truths. We're not talking about peripheral doctrines. We're talking about the essentials. Turn with me, please, first of all, to Ishayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet. We'll look tonight at the belt of truth. Isaiah chapter 59 tells us this in verse 17. He put on a breastplate like righteousness and a helmet of salvation on his head. The spiritual armor of Ephesians 6 was familiar to the Jews from the Old Testament, mainly the book of Isaiah. The shoes of the gospel of peace came from Isaiah 52. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. But here in chapter 59 we see the belt of truth, we see the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Jews would have known these concepts using military armor as an illustration of spiritual warfare. The Jews would have known it from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, from their culture. Paul, as a rabbi who's a Roman citizen and who's familiar with Greek culture, has the task of explaining these things to people from the Greco-Roman world, many of them from pagan backgrounds. How do you take concepts only Jews would have known in the first century and explain it to non-Jews? Well, what Paul actually does is he takes Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 59 and he repackages it. He recontextualizes it using the illustration of a Roman legionnaire's armor. The idea of the breastplate and the helmet from Isaiah, the shoes from Isaiah, the belt, he puts it into the language people could understand that they all knew about the Roman legionnaires. Look with me, please, with this in view, to Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our strength is always in the Lord, but it's a sobering thought to know the most powerful being God ever created is fallen and he's scheming. The most powerful being God ever created is scheming continually. He's scheming against you, he's scheming against me. As we speak tonight, he's scheming against your family, your children. He's scheming against my family, my children. He's scheming against your marriage. He's scheming against my marriage. He's scheming against your church here in the American Great Plains. He's scheming against my church in England. He's always at it. And he has a lot of experience. And he's at it 24-7. And he has centuries of practice. Hence, our strength must be in the Lord, not in ourselves. But Paul keeps reiterating this idea, put on all the armor. If something's missing, that's the point of vulnerability. That's where Satan will attack. You're missing a breastplate, he'll go after the torso. You're missing the helmet, he'll put something in your head. Put down the shield of faith, that's where he'll attack you. He reiterates, all of it is essential. Some of it is no good. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Muslims are our enemy. Make no mistake about it. But I don't hate Muslims. I hate Islam, but I don't hate Muslims. I'd much rather they be saved. The ecumenical movement is the enemy of Christ. The ecumenical movement is the enemy of the body of Christ. I don't hate Chuck Colson. I hate what he is, I hate what he does, but I don't hate him. I'd much rather see that man repent. Our struggle is never against flesh and blood. The gay lobby is our enemy. But I'm not against homosexuals and lesbians. 
On the contrary, I'm for homosexuals and lesbians. I hope they get saved. I know many homosexuals and lesbians who the Lord has saved and set free from that perversion. The struggle is against flesh and blood? No, it's against demonic powers, not against people. But then it continues. There's always a demonic force on back of this wickedness. The enemy you see is not the real enemy. The enemy you see is but the stooge. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, there it is all of it, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Once again, stand firm. The evil day is an eschatological nuance. It hints to the last days. It points to the events that will precede the return of Christ. The evil day, definite article in Greek. Paul is a rabbi and he's using a principle of Jewish midrash called kal v'homer. Kal v'homer. Light to heavy. Kal v'homer. The New Testament uses it very often. Kal v'homer. Something that is true in a light situation becomes especially true in a heavy situation. And it's particularly used in the New Testament with regard to the last days. For instance, Hebrews 10.25. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another. Fellowship is always important, but especially as you see the day approaching. In the last days, it becomes vital to survival. If we can't stand together, we'll never stand alone. There's always been false prophets. They've always been around. They're nothing new, but in the last days, they crawl out of the woodwork. Kal the Homer. What's true in a light situation becomes especially true in a heavy situation. Paul would have learned this from his mentor, Rabbi Gamaliel, the grandson of Rabbi Hillel, from the Midot of Rabbi Hillel. God used Paul's rabbinic background to explain these things in the evil day. In other words, the armor is always important, but in the last days, it is absolutely crucial to our survival. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm for the third time, it says it having girded your loins with the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Now God has his peace plan. Of course, his idea of peace is different than man's. Our idea is the Western Hellenistic one. Irene, we get the girl's name Irene. It means an absence of conflict. As Dr. Samuel Johnson sardonically said in his dictionary in London in the 18th century, peace is a period of preparation and deception between two wars. That's not God's definition. His definition is shalom. Shlomi ani yaten lahem lo kamaho olam. My peace I give you, not like the world. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. Shalom comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb les shalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Shalom comes from les shalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have shalom because the Messiah came to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the Torah that no Jew and no man could keep, and to fill us with his spirit. Now ultimately, God's shalom will include the absence of conflict. In the millennial reign of Jesus, the nations will indeed beat their spears into pruning hooks. But in the meantime, you can be in the worst crisis of your life and have shalom. God's peace plan comes from the gospel. People being saved in sight, disciples. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Isaiah 52, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Bisora in Hebrew, Evangelion in Greek, the gospel. God's peace plan is the gospel. This afternoon, our brother Roger showed you Rick, God, uh, Rick Warren's peace plan. Rick Warren's peace plan is an acronym. The P is for promoting reconciliation. The E is for education. The A is for assisting the sick. The C is for caring for the poor. And the other E is for equipping pastors and so forth to carry out the purpose-driven agenda. Given the fact he has two E's in his peace plan, shouldn't one of them be evangelism? Shouldn't one of them be witnessing? He's got his peace plan. God has a different one. Which peace plan do you want? You cannot believe the New Testament and the purpose-driven lie. I will debate Rick Warren any time, any place, as long as it's in front of a video camera. Preferably in the presence of a Greek expert. Let's continue. Paul goes on to write then, put on this armor. But notice the order it has to be put on. The first thing is the belt, the belt of truth. Then, 
the breastplate of righteousness. The belt went around the waist. The Greek word is periozomai. But it was buttressed with other straps that went around the thighs. And an X strap came on the back like this. Making an X on the back. Hanging off the waist. Coming up the back like an X. On which, in the front, you suspended the breastplate. In other words, you could not put on the breastplate until the Roman legionnaire first put on the belt. You cannot have righteousness without truth. If someone does not believe true doctrine, they are not going to be righteous. A brief Hebrew lesson, if you will indulge me. To be right in Hebrew is tzodek, a tzodek, you're right, to a female atzodeket. A righteous person, a tzaddik. A tzaddik is tzodek. Charity, tzedakah. We say, sing in Hebrew, Adon hakavod nerakam lachim shemer tzedakah umar pe piknafecha. Thou art the Lord of glory, thou art the King of kings, thou art the Son of righteousness. You cannot have tzedakah, righteousness, which is the same word for charity. You cannot have charity. Staka, unless you are tzedek. You cannot be a righteous person or a charitable person. You cannot be a tzaddik unless you are tzedek. If your doctrine is wrong, you are wrong. Now it is possible to put on the belt without the breastplate. Having right doctrine does not automatically guarantee somebody is righteous. It may be an indication of it, but it's not prima facie proof. Having right doctrine does not prove somebody is righteous. But having wrong doctrine automatically proves in God's eyes they are not righteous. Oh, they're a loving person. Oh, he's so kind. Oh, you shouldn't be judgmental. I'm not. It's what God's word says. If they believe fundamental doctrinal error, they do not have what God calls real charity, love. They do not have real righteousness. It's just Stupid religious babbling, emotional frivolity, but it's not what God calls righteousness. I've been hearing this over and over. Look at Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1 9. Paul writes, And this I pray that your love, your agape, unconditional love, real love, divine love, that your love will abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. Notice that love cannot abound without knowledge of God's word and discernment. If there's no discernment and no knowledge of God's word, there's not love. There's a stupid, cheap, religious counterfeit. There is a cheap brand of religious emotionalism masquerading as spirituality. But it is not love. This has been the downfall of my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals. They confuse feeling and emotion with spirituality. They substitute experience for doctrine. Instead of using the word of God to judge experience, experience becomes their doctrine, but it's all a counterfeit. If what you believe is false, the rest doesn't matter. My own family is a combination of Jewish and Roman Catholic. As a kid growing up in New York, I went to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. Yes, I was... Dipped and clipped. <laughs> Dave Hunt quoted John Hagee. I have Jewish family on their way to hell without their Messiah. At this moment, my wife is in Israel witnessing to her mother who's very old and very ill. Her parents are Holocaust survivors. To my wife's parents, Christianity is Nazis putting Jewish children into an oven in the name of Jesus. That's what they think it is. It's a tragedy. But my wife is a Jew who believes. She's telling her Jewish mother, Yeshua is our Messiah. They have to know the truth. John Hagee, don't tell me you love the Jewish people. This is my family you're talking about. And you're withholding the way of salvation. You're letting them enter eternity without the way of salvation. I have a mother who will trust in a scapula. She'll trust in a statue of Mary. She'll trust in sacraments but she will not trust in the completed work of Jesus Christ. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone in purgatory for your own? 
Which gospel do you want to believe? Don't call it love. Find another name for it. And don't call it Christianity. To leave that old Irish lady, or that old Polish lady, or that old Austrian lady, or that old Hispanic lady, on a deathbed, clenching rosary beads, afraid to die and going to purgatory, when she can have the assurance of salvation, when she can know the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, to leave her dying in fear, don't call it love. Call it Chuck Colson. Call it ecumenism. But don't call it love. It is not the love of Jesus. It is not love that is sick. That your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. Put on the belt. You take off the belt of truth. The first thing that falls off is the breastplate of righteousness. When I was first saved in the aftermath of the Jesus movement, hippies, last time there was a revival in America, I never knew of two born-again Christians who got divorced. I knew people who were divorced and remarried before they were saved. I knew people who got saved and their unsaved husband or their unsaved wife left them. But the idea of two saved Christians getting divorced and remarried, I never knew anybody like that, and I never knew anybody who knew anybody like that. That was for the world. Now our divorce rate is as high as the secular world. You've got major preachers, major television preachers who are divorced and remarried, some of them multiple times. How did that happen? I hate divorce, saith the Lord. What part of hate don't I understand? How did it happen? Easy. Take off the belt. All you've got to do is take off the belt and the breastplate will fall to the ground of its own accord. I live in England. The Church of England, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Church of Scotland, the United Reformed Church, the Methodists, all of them are ordaining homosexuals. All of them are ordaining lesbians. I guess Romans chapter 1 isn't in their Bible. How can this happen? John Wesley preached holiness. The founders of the Church of England were burned alive in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. How can it happen? Easy. Take off the belt. How could a man like Tony Campola be doing what he's doing with the homosexuals, the Muslims, and God knows who else? He actually went on radio in England and said, God loved David because of his gusto. Even when David sinned, he did it with gusto. That's why God loved him. Isn't Psalm 51 in his Bible? How can it be so sick and perverted? How can people listen to this? Easy. All you've got to do is take off the belt. Anything goes. Divorce, remarriage, homosexual ordination, same-sex marriage, anything. All you got to do is take off the belt. Turn with me, please, to Yermiyahu Hanavi, Jeremiah chapter 13. Let's see what happens when Israel took off the belt. The word for belt in Hebrew is izor, meaning region, but it has two letters in its root or shortish in common with the word lazor, to help. The belt helps something else to stay on. Unlike the Roman, the Hebrew belt was tightly woven fabric. It was a tightly woven fabric. If fabric became dehydrated, Either it would rehydrate, or it would simply degrade and crumble to nothing. Let's look at verse 1 of Jeremiah 13. Then thus the Lord said to me, Go buy yourself a linen belt, put it around your waist, but do not put it in water. So I bought the waistband in accordance with the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, Take the waistband, take the belt that you've bought, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in the crevice of a rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord had commanded me. 
And it came about after many days that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the belt which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates, dug, <coughs> and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it. And though the waistband was ruined, it was totally worthless. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This wicked people, wicked people, who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them, to bow down to them, let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. For as the waistband clings to the waist of man, so I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me for a people of renown, for praise and glory. But they did not listen. Let's begin with this idea of clinging, clinging. The Hebrew word is devakut, devakut. From the word devik, meaning glue in modern Hebrew. Tape in modern Hebrew is said as devik, literally a glue ribbon. But in Biblical Hebrew, it comes from Genesis chapter 3 when God created man. The husband shall leave his, leave his parents and cling to his wife, this clinging to. It speaks of a cohesive bonding. They would not listen to my word. It was the belt of truth. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. It was the belt of truth that made the Jewish nation cling to God. When they wore the belt, they were clinging to Yahweh. When they took the belt off, righteousness fell. And they ended up in Babylon. This diva coup today is completely perverted by ultra-Orthodox Jews. You don't see them out here in the West, but you'd see them in New York or somewhere. You've seen them in movies. They look like the Amish people. They dress in black suits with ear curls called peyot. And they practice a form of Gnosticism that was originally adopted from ancient Babylon, called Kabbalah, not the Hollywood kind that Madonna is into, the real thing. It's based on a work called the Zohar. These people believe that God has no essence, only emanations, attributes. He's lost his identity. Something a theologian would call a kenosis has happened to God, and they have to help him regain his identity. And they do this by capturing holy sparks called zumzumim, zumzums. So you see them going like this, davening, it's called davening, and they're twirling their ear curls, helping God regain his identity. Now what does this have to do with the Torah or the Old Testament? Nothing. Where did it come from? Babylon. It comes from Babylonian Gnosticism. What they call emanations is simply a demiurge. The New Agers have the same thing. You see, whenever you take off the belt, your ultimate destination will be Babylon. But let's look at Jeremiah Yermiyahu. The word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord. In Greek, logos. And archaic kaiho logos. In the beginning was the word. In Aramaic, mamra. But in Hebrew, dvar. Dvar Adonai. Jesus is the word who became flesh. Of course, not according to Rick Warren's Bible of choice. That's called The Message by Eugene Peterson. That says, the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. The Greek says the logos became sarks and tetaskenod, tabernacled among us. What it's saying is the same God who was in the Shekinah in the Old Testament will become a man and dwell among us in the person of Jesus. He moved into our neighborhood. Notice Rick Warren's Bible has no relationship to the original meaning of the original Greek or Hebrew. Why? because his doctrine has no relationship to the Word of God. The Word of the Lord came to Isaiah, or to Amos, or to Micah. Always the Word of the Lord. False prophets will always give you a word. I have a word. I have a word. The Lord gave me a word. True prophets will point you to the word. I have a word. That's not prophecy. That's clairvoyance. Most of what is being called prophecy today, like that John Hink Hinckley guy, the, the maniac on TBN, he was a clairvoyant. He was not a prophet. Benny Hinn is a clairvoyant. He's not a prophet. Deuteronomy 18 says he's a kind of a prophet, a false one. He predicts things in God's name that don't happen. Dave was 100% right. 
But let's look. Jeremiah was like the other prophets. He didn't just prophesy by what he said, but the way he lived and what he did. He became the personification of the nation he was prophesying to. All the prophets did. Isaiah had to walk around naked because the nation lost the garments of salvation. Ezekiel had to shave his hair and beat it with the sword because the nation was going to be scattered. Don't look at a prophet's words alone. Look at their life. Jeremiah became the personification of what he was prophesying to. The same as Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin. He took our sin. He became identified with us. Jeremiah became identified with this backslid nation. The nation would go into the Babylonian captivity, so he did. Now, it was not a straight line through the wilderness, <coughs> just head east to get to the Euphrates. Not enough oasis, not enough water. He would have had to take the same journey Abraham took, pretty much, or the same journey that would be taken in the captivity. He would have had to go north by northeast, up through Syria, to Kurdistan, and then down, like this. A long, arduous journey. But first, before he went, he had to wear the belt for a while. He had to wear it for a while. Why? Because the Jewish people wore the belt for a while. They held the word of God for a while. For a while, they kept the scriptures. For a while, they observed the Torah. For a while. But then they took it off and ended up in Babylon. So then he had to take it off and go where they were going to go. He hides it near the Euphrates, but God tells him, don't put it into the water. Again, if a fabric dehydrates, it will either be rehydrated or else it will degrade and crumble to nothing. I know people in Oxford, Cambridge, Princeton, Yale Divinity School, one theological cemetery after another. I'm not demeaning theological education. I went to a pretty good seminary, academically speaking, but I know professors, experts in Greek and Hebrew who aren't even born again, who aren't even saved. It's just a book to them. It's just history and literature, and they even question if it's historically accurate. It's only the Holy Spirit that can put life into that text. You and I can witness and witness to unsaved people all we want until the eclenctos in Greek takes place, until the eclectic of the Holy Spirit, until they're convicted. They're not going to get saved. Until they hear the voice of Jesus, not the voice of Jacob, they're not going to get saved. There has to be water in the belt. Oh, it's the belt is fine. It's God's word. But when it becomes dehydrated, it becomes worthless. The Jews will read the Torah in the synagogue ritually and liturgically. Every Shabbat, they will read the Parakash The Catholics will read the Gospel and the Epistle from the Missal. They'll read it liturgically in the Mass. They've got the belt, you understand, but it's dehydrated. The Spirit of God is not in it. What do you think is the case of most of what is left of the Lutheran Church? But let's look. Take it off. Then go back and get it, and he goes back to get it, but it's become worthless. He couldn't put it in the water. The term for this kind of water at the headwaters of the Euphrates would be Maim Hayim in Hebrew. Maim Hayim, living water. Comes from Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour out my spirit, I'll send the rain. John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well in Samaria, I will give you Maim Hayim. John chapter 7, verse 39. I'll give you mine, Hayim, living water. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God had departed. Ichabod, Echavod. Look what they're doing now. They're not expounding the Word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They're taking a few verses out of context and engaging in anecdotes and storytelling. It's hype. What they're doing is using motivational psychology with Christian jargon that's all most preaching is become today motivational psychology using Christian jargon the belt is there but there's no water in it it's dehydrated it's crumbling it's degraded it's ruined it can no longer cling they no longer cling to God because they no longer cling to his word Hasidic Jews can twirl their ear curls all they want and try to capture the zoom zooms with their mysticism, 
with their Kabbalah, they're not going to cling to Yahweh. You cling to God by clinging to His Word. Take off that belt. Good luck, you're sure going to need it. But what's the first thing that happens when you take off the belt? The breastplate falls to the ground. How are they justifying what they're doing? Homosexual and lesbian ordination. How are they justifying what they're doing? Divorce and remarriage. How are they justifying what they're doing? Money preachers preying on the poor and unemployed. How are they justifying? There's no breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness is gone. Just take off the belt. The first thing that hits the ground is righteousness. It falls off immediately. You depart from the word of God, righteousness falls to the ground. There is no tzedakah unless you are tzedek. Well, let's continue. The word of the Lord came to me and said, I will destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Pride is the first sin. It was Satan's first sin according to Isaiah 14. It was man's first sin in Genesis 3. Man wanting to be God, Dave Hunt touched on it. You're looking at not Mara Cirillo, but at God. This goes right back to the garden. Pride. Now understand this, pride is the seminal sin, it's the sin that begets other sin. What do you see? Greed, under the greed is pride. Lust, under the lust is pride. Unrighteous anger, under the unrighteous anger is pride. Pride is the seminal sin that begets other sin. It was man's first sin, it was Satan's first sin. 1 Corinthians 5, put away the leaven. The leaven of malice and wickedness, your boasting is not good. Leaven is a picture of pride in biblical typology. It puffs up contributing nothing to the nutritional value of the bread. It just puffs up. Your boasting's not good. Put away the leaven, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Using Paschal imagery. False doctrine is rooted in spiritual pride. What did Jesus say? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the World Council of Churches. Beware of the leaven of the tele-evangelists. It always comes from spiritual pride. That's where the judgment begins. Earl Park is only one of many heads that have rolled. But let's continue. I will judge the pride of these people who refuse to listen to my word. They refuse to listen to the word of God. Let's go back to Kalva Homer, light to heavy. That which is true in a light situation takes on an expanded level of importance in a heavy one. It becomes amplified. Look with me, please, to 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 3. Jeremiah says, these people refuse to listen to my word. Paul says, for the time will come in verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires who will turn their ears from truth and turn aside to myths. They will not endure sound doctrine. They will not put up with it. Why do you think the churches in Fargo wouldn't support this conference? They won't put up with sound doctrine in the last days. They will not endure people who tell the truth. They'll put up with people who tell a lie. But they will not endure people who tell the truth. Paul says that would happen. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desire. No, they won't listen to Roger Oakland or Dave Hunt. But they'll listen to Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. That's the way it is. Well, what happened to Israel? when they refused to listen. Where did they end up? Babylon, 
Where will the apostate church end up? Babylon. More of that in a moment. Let's go back to Jeremiah once more, chapter 13, please. This wicked people, in verse 10, refuse to listen to my words. They walk in the stubbornness of their own hearts. They've gone after other gods to serve them, to bow down to them. Let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. Idolatry. The Hebrew word for to worship, hishtakvaya, hishtachavot. Greek proskuto. What does it mean to bow down? No matter what anybody says, you bow down before a graven image. God calls that an act of idolatry. The Hebrew term, avodazerah, a form of worship that's alien to the word of God. When those priests burned strange fire, they didn't burn it to another god, they burned it to Yahweh. Unbiblical worship is the same as idolatry to God. And today our worship has become unbiblical. Instead of the worship of the Lord, we have the worship of worship. It's based down in Nashville, Tennessee. What used to be the Christian music ministry is now the Christian music industry. Most of the Christian recording companies are like the publishing companies. They're owned by secular conglomerates. So many so-called worship leaders are failed pop stars. They couldn't make it in the secular world. Now they're going to use their lack of talent for the Lord. They are entertainers. It's the worship of worship. We've pointed out a number of times, no doxology without theology. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the doctrine is not right, God does not accept the worship. Just look at it. I've warned about this many times. Our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, never himself. He's God. But he's only worshipped as God in the context of the triunity of the Godhead. Just like holy, 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 God in three persons, perfectly biblical. But good morning, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall, come Holy Spirit. None of that is biblical. You begin going into that, it's avodah zerah. You'll get an alien spirit counterfeiting the Holy Spirit like they had in Toronto, Canada, and in Pensacola, Florida. That's a counterfeit spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is a krete in Greek, self-control, not the lack of it. And I say that as a Pentecostal. That stuff is not Pentecost, that stuff is sick. It is not biblical Pentecostalism. It is not biblical charismata, it is charismania. People get sucked into the doctrine by singing choruses mindlessly. Jesus warned not to repeat the empty phrases, but they sing it over and over and over, something that was pioneered by the Vineyard Movement. What they're doing is engaging in a mantra. It's New Age. It's a mantra. They're getting their doctrines by singing these choruses over and over and over, with no thought to the fact that the words are not even scriptural. But then it continues. I couldn't control it, I couldn't control it. The fact you couldn't control it proves it wasn't God. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. But let's look. They go after other gods. Once the breastplate falls, idolatry is coming fast on the heels. We have the worship of worship. We have the worship of mammon being called Christianity by the money preachers who Dave mentioned. Their God is mammon. That God is money. It's another God. But that's only where it begins. You've got guys like Tony Campola lining up with Muslims. You've got guys like Rick Warren saying religious pluralism is the future. There's only one God. He's the God of Israel, as David Hawking pointed out. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Allah, the Nabatebi, moon God, is not God. Hare Krishna is not God. Mara Cirillo is not God. God is God. They go after other gods to serve them. Then they go down the ecumenical road. 
Jesus himself warned repeatedly. He said, if anybody says, I've returned physically, keep away from them. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't go there. He will come back the way he left. He will return via Mount Sa'ir and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's how he's coming back. If they say he's come back physically and literally in another way, keep away, says Jesus. What do we have today? They're getting in bed with Rome. I know we're out in the plains. Do we have anybody here who used to be a Roman Catholic? Put your hand up, please. Can I ask all the Roman Catholics, who, people who were saved out of Roman Catholicism to stand up? One moment. You see these dear people? God bless them. You want to know what Roman Catholicism is? Ask somebody saved out of it. Don't ask a deceiver like Chuck Colson. When you say bread and wine becomes Jesus Christ incarnate, and you worship it, the blessed sacrament, you pray to the bread and wine. Now when you understand John 6 in a Jewish context, you understand the Last Supper, Zotasun Zikroni, do this in remembrance of me, it's a memorial from the Jewish Passover. You worship and pray to the bread and wine, and then you eat him and drink his blood. In Acts 15, the apostles condemned the ritual consumption of blood. I don't think Roman Catholics are vampires and cannibals. I don't believe that. But if I believed in transubstantiation, I would say they are. They think they are. They think they're really drinking his blood, even though the apostles said don't do it, and even though Jesus said I'm not coming back physically. It's another God, it's another Jesus. The plastic dude on the dashboard is not the real one. It's like the Mormons that Jesus crossed the Latter-day Saints. I got a burn in my bosom and I testify to you. Church of Latter-day Saints is true. There Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. They say that? And you've got major evangelicals, people I used to respect like Craig Blomberg and Craig Hazen from Biola. Ravi Zacharias playing footsies with these guys? What does God say? You take off the belt, you walk in the stubbornness of your heart, <coughs> you will go after other gods. Alas, the emergent church. Truth is not objective, it's subjective, it's relational. It's not propositional, it's experiential. We need the Lectio Divina, we need contemplative prayer. We need labyrinths. We need icons and graven images like the Greek Orthodox. We need to burn incense and candles to experience the spirituality. We need Gregorian chants. These are people who say they're born again, you understand? These emergent church people say they're saved. God says that they ever were saved, they're backslidden. They've gone after other gods and they stubbornly won't listen. This wicked people who refuse to listen to my word. For as the waistband clings to the waist of man, so I made the whole household of Israel cling to me, that they might be for me a people for renown, praise and glory. But they didn't listen. What does it say in Romans 11? If God's own people, Israel, couldn't get away with this, if he didn't spare the natural branches, is he going to spare Lutherans out in the Great Plains? Let's understand this. Where did Jeremiah go? Babylon. Where does Hasidic Judaism come from? Babylon. Where did the Jews of Jeremiah's day end up? Babylon. It begins with the Tower of Babel in Genesis. Man trying to reach God. The false religious system of the world in league, in confederation with its corrupt political system. The very things Roger was explaining earlier today about the three stools. The political, the economic, and the religious. It's not new. Roger is exactly right. It begins in the days of Semiramis and Nimrod in Babylon. The Babylonian Empire was its Old Testament anticlimax and shadow. <coughs> the way the Jews went into the Babylonian captivity is a picture of Babylon to come. Writing in the first century, Peter wrote in his epistle, She who is in Babylon greets you. 
The mystery religions of the world all came from Babylon. Just look at the zodiac, for instance. You've got the Chinese horoscope, the Hindu horoscope, and the Greek one that we follow in the world, well, that people follow in the West. But they're all the same. Why? They all come from Babylon. Doesn't matter if you call him Balamar, Duck, he's the same. He comes from Babylon. All comes from Babylon. The mystery religions of ancient Babylon found their way through Asia Minor, particularly the city of Pergamon, where Satan's throne is, into the Greco Roman world. From there, into the pantheon of Rome, the leader was the emperor, the Pontificus Maximus, a title he bequeathed to the papacy. So Peter in his epistle writes, she who was in Babylon greets you. The early Christians would have understood that woman on seven hills as Rome. But here we are in Lutheran country. There's more practicing Lutherans here in the Dakotas and in Minnesota than you would actually have in Germany, even though it's the Stattenkirk. Luther makes me tremble. I'll tell you why. He reminds me of King Joash, a man who began right and ended badly. I cannot defend the way that man ended. And the peasants revolt, saying the peasants should be stabbed in the back. He wrote, Quius regio eius religio, whatever your government is, your religion should be. If your government is Catholic, be a Catholic. If the Protestant, be a pro Luther wrote that. His ideas of consubstantiation at the Carlois Marlboro, he, Luther ended badly. But he began right. One of his last sermons, his diatribe against the Jews, he inspired Hitler. He was quoted extensively in Mein Kampf. He helped inspire the Holocaust nearly 450 years later. I don't defend the way Luther ended, but he began right. Here I stand. And when he was still right, he wrote something called the Babylonian captivity of the church. He understood what had happened to medieval Catholicism, Babylon. And he was from the intelligentsia of the Roman priesthood, as were the other reformers. Babylon's been around in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the history of the church, all the way back to Genesis. But all the Babylons in the Bible and in history are shadows of the coming Babylon, Babylon the Great. Where is this stuff going to end that John Higgins was talking about? Where is this stuff going to end that Roger Oakland was talking about? Where is this stuff going to end that Dave Hunt was talking about? Where is this stuff going to end that David Hocking was talking about? It's going to end in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 5. It's going to end where it ended in the days of Jeremiah. Upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Babylon the Great, the mother of whores. That's where it's going. That's where the word faith movement's taking you. That's where the ecumenical movement is taking you. That is where the purpose-driven lie is taking the body of Christ to Babylon. All you've got to do is take off the belt. That's all. Just take off the belt. You take off the belt... Babylon becomes the inevitable destination, as Jeremiah showed us. You take off the belt, the breastplate falls to the ground, there will be an avalanche of immorality, a maelstrom of, 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 of moral departure from fundamental decency. San Francisco, teaching little kids to read, Danny's two daddies, Maria's two mummies, and if you oppose it, you're a homophobe. All you got to do is take off the belt. That's all. A so-called Christian president who puts in the White House a Koran to honor Islam, a book that says God has no son. First John, that's Antichrist, which denies the Father's son. And our present president put it in the White House. And every year since September 11th has celebrated Ramadan in the White House to honor Islam. In other words, the Saudi oil lobby. That's a Christian president. See what happens if you try to celebrate Christmas in Saudi Arabia. How does it happen? How can this happen? When you look at the faith of the national founders of this country. Easy. How do you wind up with a bush when you begin with people of faith like Washington and Lincoln? Easy. Take off the belt. That's what happened to Israel. They took off the belt. 
That's what happened to Great Britain. They took off the belt. That's what's happening to the United States. We took off the belt. That's what's happened to the body of Christ. We took off the belt. Righteousness has fallen. Other gods have come in, and we are well on the way to Babylon. Well, I don't want to go. By the grace and mercy of Jesus, I don't want to go. I don't want my family to go. And I don't want you or your family to go. This is the belt. This is the belt. Put it on and leave it on. Don't take it off for anybody. Don't take it off for any televangelist. Don't take it off for any theocratic politician. Don't take it off for any denomination. Don't take it off for anybody. This is the belt. Put it on and keep it on. God bless.